welcome to our Ultimate Friday. <laughs> that's that's the kind of enthusiasm <laughs> that I was looking for. All right, so uh, today uh, we'll be talking uh, for uh, about as much as we can get to uh, in terms of. Parallelism, having a computer system do multiple things uh, simultaneously and, in fact, have multiple parts of a computer program trying to work together simultaneously and some of the issues that come up with that. Uh, before we get there, any questions on uh, the proxy lab or other stuff we've been looking at? All right. So, I want to start off with a bit of history of computing. And particularly, this is going to, I think, set the stage for why parallelism has basically become an unavoidable part of writing modern software. So, on the x-axis here, I'll zoom in a bit, is time, years, and on the y-axis is uh, the value of all sorts of different aspects of a CPU uh, that this chart is describing. So we can talk about how many thousands of transistors there are, and kind of how many of these tiny circuits that can either uh, have a one or a zero, how many of those are, are packed on to the chip. We can uh, think about how fast does a single threaded application perform. That's the blue line. Uh, frequency given in millions of hertz or millions of operations per second is kind of how many operations per second a processor can perform. Um, and as we can see, this line getting up to the thousands, kind of uh, recent processor frequencies are measured in gigahertz, billions of operations per second. Uh, we also have to think about how much power does the CPU consume here given in watts. Uh, and we're also going to look at how many cores, how many kind of separate uh, cores, each of which can be executing an instruction or actually present on the chip. And the main observation to take away from this chart is that from the 1970s up until the early 2000s, uh, the story was pretty simple. Uh, more and more and more transistors were packed on to a chip. Uh, the speed of the individual CPUs just kept getting faster and faster. They consumed more and more power. And this resulted in uh, an exponential increase in the performance of a single threaded application. And this was really nice for software developers because it meant that every couple of years, uh, the computers that you're designing software for got about twice as fast. And so there was sort of a you didn't have to necessarily uh, worry that much that if you wanted to do kind of more complicated things in the next version of some application, well, the computers had also gotten faster. So what happened in the early 2000s is that uh, if we wanted to pack transistors even more densely, make these chips even faster, they would have needed to continue consuming more power. And there's a direct relationship between how much power is consumed and how much heat is generated by the chip. And we reached the point where making these chips, the individual CPUs faster and with more transistors, was just going to make them too hot to practically put in, say, a laptop or a desktop computer. That you just like could not cool these things if we kept making them faster. 
And so we see that the power consumption and the frequency, and indeed the performance of a single threaded application all kind of level out as we stop seeing this increase. Uh, but the number of transistors has continued to go up. And that is because the number of cores, we're like, well, we can't make the individual core faster, so let's just slap more cores onto our chip. And that doesn't make single threaded applications any faster, but this orange line parallel performance, if you can take full advantage of those multiple cores, you're still getting uh, that exponential increase in performance. And so the upshot here is that for modern software to take advantage of what modern processors can offer, they need to have multiple threads to be able to use those multiple cores. Now the multiple cores are useful if we just want to do many different single threaded things at the same time, but to make an individual program faster, it's got to have multiple threads. Oh. Can you just please repeat what the capacitors are? Uh, transistors are tiny circuits that have a voltage across them that is either high or low. They're the things that are sending a one or a zero uh, around the chip. And so uh, here we're talking about billions of transistors packed onto something about this big. So they are nanometers in size is uh, the level at which uh, we're able to manufacture um, uh, these semiconductors, uh, and they're kind of the, the fundamental building block of all of all the circuitry. Fuck. Wait, so cores is like is that like a is that what we're like is that like a CPU and thread is something else? Uh, so the uh, I I must confess I'm not always super precise about these <clears throat> terms, uh, but one way to think about it is that the CPU is the entire like product that you buy from Intel or AMD or one of these companies, and that's what you stick in your computer. And uh, that, that CPU just used to have one, for a long time just had one core on it, and now it has multiple cores, each of which can be executing an instruction at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? So. Is Moore's law for transistors or performance? Because I see both are linear uh, law for parallel. Yeah, so uh, there was an observation uh, by a computer scientist named Moore that uh, compute the density of transistors was doubling about every one and a half years. Uh, and for a long time, this translated directly into the performance of a single-threaded application was going to double every one and a half years. Uh, and so for single-threaded performance, that is broken down. But at least so far, packing extra cores has let it kind of continue as far as transistors go. So why exactly would like uh, the frequency of a single core uh, affect the single-thread performance? I guess it's just like one core can only do if there was one strand at the time. Yes, yeah, so if we have a single threaded application, it has a single thread that is running on some core, and that core is running at a certain speed, uh, some number of operations it can do every second. And so that single threaded application, if the core it's running on can do more operations per second, it can run faster. But we reached a point where due to power and heat constraints, we couldn't keep making kind of consumer cores faster. Um, and so that meant that we also so didn't continue to see the same improvement in single thread performance. Kevin. So is the speed of a core directly translate to how many transistors it has? Uh, that has often been the relationship, but it's, uh, as you can imagine, a lot more complicated than just like a simple, like, uh, because there's, uh, I'll show a little bit of this, but there's a ton of design work that goes into how to actually arrange the transistors into all sorts of the complicated modules uh, that go into the CPU. All right.
speaking of that, uh, here is a picture of a couple processors. Um, and so uh, you may have heard about the new Apple uh, CPUs, the, the Apple M1. Um, came out uh, a couple years ago, and these CPUs are based on uh, the ARM architecture, which is a different instruction set than the x86 that we've been looking at. Um, and pictured on the left here is the first ARM processor, which was about seven millimeters wide, uh, and um, uh, it was a kind of three micrometer process, which means like three micrometers is the kind of smallest, uh, as kind of the scale of the individual transistors. Uh, this M1 processor kind of shown at an equivalent scale to the ARM1, it's about 11 meters wide, but it is a five nanometer process. So uh, a thousand times uh, more fine. And if this ARM1 chip were built using the process for the M1, it would fit inside this little red circle, like that tiny dot inside the red circle. That is the ARM1 chip, if you made exactly the same chip with today's capabilities. So the, the scale of these is sort of crazy. Um, and just to highlight uh, some things that we've talked about, uh, and how they actually show up on a chip. Um, uh, the ARM1 had 100 bytes worth of registers, and they lived in this section of the chip. Uh, it had an arithmetic logic unit. That's the ALU, the part of the chip that actually does the arithmetic. They do 32-bit arithmetic. Uh, uh, that lived right here. Uh, the Apple M1, the actual uh, one of the 64-bit CPU cores is only kind of this uh, relatively small portion of this chip. The M1 um, is what, what Apple refers to as a system on a chip. And there's lots of different components of the system all sort of integrated into this one chip, uh, including, of course, caches, 12 megabyte cache living right here. All right, so this is all to say that we have these... Uh, powerful parallel processors, and we need some way to take advantage uh, uh, of them. And an important part of taking advantage of them is having multiple threads sort of cooperate uh, to uh, uh, doing the work of a, of a particular program. But when we have multiple threads cooperating, and sharing memory, we open up an entirely new category of terrible bugs. And one of the most pernicious of these is called a data race, or it's also referred to as a race condition. And here's the situation. Uh, we have thread A and thread B. And thread A says sets some variable x equal to 1. And thread B sets some variable x equal to 2. And we're wondering, well, what is the value of x after both of these threads have finished this operation? And can anyone uh, guess why this is called, like, why this is called a race? PJ? Because uh, which uh, which data like without modification? So which data without modification last you see the one with like that then sets the value? Exactly. That if thread A runs first, the final value of x is two because thread B overwrites thread A. And if thread B runs first, then the final value is 1. So our program has non-deterministic behavior based on just which thread happens to beat the other. 
in terms of modifying this location in memory. And that's not good. We want our programs to be predictable and not sometimes do unexpected things uh, due to parallelism. Um, another, um, like we might be tempted to say, um, we always want, say, uh, thread B to go last. Um, and so maybe we have some variable that we're going to use to sort of indicate when thread A or thread B are kind of doing this task. Fine. Um, so with these, these threads, then I assume this would have to be something that isn't on. I guess I don't really. Would they know that because they're threads, they get here? Yes. The, they can mess with each other because they share. Yeah, these were separate processes, we wouldn't have, have this problem, but then they couldn't cooperate. Uh, and maybe we say, we want to say, thread B is going to say if. solve our problem? Are we going to ensure that thread B is always going to go after thread A? Kevin? Um, I believe so, but only if they're running on the same thread. So like, oh, I've been off here. Yeah, these are specifically two different threads. Yeah, so I, I don't think so, because it's still, it's still a matter of yeah, I think so. Fine. Um, I mean, the only way to really do it is to prevent one from running until the other is completed, which kind of defeats the purpose of threads, right? Uh, yeah, if, if we want to synchronize these, force them to go in a certain order, we do, in fact, need to do something where we just pause one until the other is finished. Uh, but fortunately, these situations are usually only a small part of the larger program where we need things to happen in a certain order. Uh, you kind of program that needs to be synchronized gets a special name. The critical section. So uh, the critical section of our program, for that part only, we need our threads to maybe happen in a certain order. But then the rest, they're free to kind of uh, uh, happen when, whenever they do. But, would we have to have x equals 1 be before a has um, gone so that we don't accidentally get halfway through thread A and thread B starts? Yeah, so this is, this is the key point here. That when we're dealing with multiple threads, the operations of those threads can be interleaved in arbitrary ways, which just means at any point we can switch from running one thread to the other and back 
And so we don't have, we can't predict kind of ahead of time necessarily when these switches are going to occur. That's determined by the operating system and the hardware. And so if we need something to happen in a certain way, we have to take extra steps. But here we could set A has gone to one, and then we switch to B. B goes, sets X to two, and then we switch back to A. And A overwrites what B did. Uh, and so if we reorder these, and set x equal 1, uh, this happens first. Then in this kind of very simple example, we have kind of, we have guaranteed that the only time that b can ever leave this while loop is after x has made its change, or after thread a has made its change to x. So having like a while loop like that wouldn't, you know, decrease the flow? Uh, I agree. This is not a great strategy. It's an approach called busy waiting, where a thread waits by just spinning endlessly in a loop. And this can certainly uh, uh, harm performance because the thread, this thread is just sitting here checking this variable over and over instead of letting some other thread do useful work. Uh, I was going to ask like, how much the thread is. Uh, yeah, it, it really depends on kind of how the operating system kind of decides what thread to run with. Um, so let's uh, look at a slightly more complicated example where thread A does x equal y plus 1, and thread b is y equals y minus 2. And initially, we have y equals 12. So, what are the possible values that x might have after these two threads run? Yeah, depending on whether we double y before or after uh, thread a, um, uh, we might get uh, 12 plus 1 or 24 plus 1. Um, and uh, it's again a race because it is depending on which one is going to win. What if I did x equals x plus 1 and x equals x plus 2? And uh, before, I'm going to have you talk with your neighbors about what the possible values of x might be. Uh, but one thing that I want you to keep in mind is that uh, this operation is not is not atomic, meaning it does not happen all at once. It may consist of reading the current value of x, adding 2 to that value, and then writing the result back to x particularly if x is a location in memory. We need to read the value from memory, do the arithmetic, write the value back. So this one line of, say, C code might actually involve three different instructions. And when our CPU is possibly interleaving operations in different orders, we're thinking at the level of different instructions being interleaved. Uh, so go ahead and discuss with your neighbors what the possible values x might have uh, after these two threads run. Uh, X is initially zero. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this.
the different possibilities. Uh, who has a, a possible value of x for me? Uh, all right, final result could be 3. Uh, what's an interleaving of our operations that would give us 3? So either uh, release thread 1 and then move, move to thread B, or use thread B. Mm -hmm. So something we could do, read x, add 1, write x, and this is A, and then B, after that, does its three operations, read x, add 2, write x. Well, okay, so just confirm they, they don't have to have they don't ever actually happen at the same time. They're the A and B. Uh so or this is yeah. Um in this we're uh, uh, if we had multiple cores, they could actually in that sense both be executing at the same time. Uh but when multiple cores access the exact same location in memory. Memory can only send the result back to one of them. And so that will actually kind of force them to access it. They can't literally access it at exact, the same memory at the exact same moment. All right, what's another possible result? What's that? Um, two or I guess like one kind of equivalent uh, if like, the uh, either thread reads before either one writes. So like uh, A reads X and then B reads X and then uh, they add and write afterwards. Um, I guess for two, we have the A writes and then B adds and writes. Exactly. That they both read, so they both have, they both think x is 0. And then thread A adds 1 to it and writes 1. And then thread B is still using the old value of x that it read, adds 2, and writes over the result that, that thread A wrote. Yeah, Holly. If uh, thread B adds before thread A writes, would that give us 3 or 2? Uh, I think it would still give it. Give us two because each of these are adding to okay. zero. Okay, okay, this makes sense. Questions on this? Yeah. If I if we just reordered uh, these two, we get one instead of two. Um. All right. So I want to talk about ways that we might try and fix this data race. Ways that we might try and get our programs to behave better. Um, but I also want to tell you about the first time in US history that uh, the country switched presidents while at war. So it was 1944. Uh, world War II uh, was uh, raging across the globe. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was finishing an unprecedented third term in office, so he'd been president for 12 years, um, and uh, he decided to, to run for an equally unprecedented fourth term, um, with part of the rationale being uh, Dr. New Deal had become Dr. Win the War and should change presidents in the middle of a war, so keep FDR around. Uh, but it was known that he was not in good health, uh, and there was serious concern that he might die uh, in his fourth term in office, and this made the choice of his vice president in 1944 uh, very important. His vice president for his first three terms had been uh, this man, Henry Wallace, uh, who was very liberal and also somewhat eccentric, and some leaders in the Democratic Party were not fond of either of those things. Uh, and so Wallace was replaced with a senator from Missouri, Harry Truman. Um, and uh, when Roosevelt and Truman ran against Thomas Dewey, governor of New York, 
Uh, it was Roosevelt's closest of his four elections, but still not particularly close. Um, and sadly, Roosevelt uh, was only a few months into his fourth term when he died, and Harry Truman uh, became president. Um, and this was not, uh, this was the first time that uh, the U.S. president changed during the war, but uh, not the last time. This, uh, uh, the U.S. war in Korea, and the U.S. war in Vietnam, and the U.S. war in Iraq, and the U.S. war in Afghanistan all uh, crossed two or more presidential administrations. Um, and after this four terms of Roosevelt, uh, political leaders decided uh, they weren't fond of the same person being elected president over and over again, and uh, we got the uh, Constitution amended to actually make it uh, part of the rules that you would only do two terms rather than just the thing that people did. Um, and uh, even though uh, Dewey was uh, soundly defeated in 1944, didn't stop him from challenging Truman uh, in 1948, uh, and the polls showed Dewey was such a commanding lead that newspapers published the headline, Dewey defeats Truman before the election. And so here you have a victorious Truman uh, gleefully holding up uh, this Chicago Daily Tribune headline. All right. Let's talk about how to make threads behave. So, again, we might be tempted to put if statements around each of these uh, to check that they only do this change to x when the other one is not in the middle of a change to x. Uh, but unfortunately, all that's going to do is to uh, kind of move our data race onto whatever variables say A is only going to do, is going to say kind of while B is going, uh, put in this loop, and then only after that set A is going to true, then do its update, then set A is going to false, and we can try and do the same thing with B while A is going, don't do anything, and then say, all right, once A is not going, say B is going, X equals X plus 2, then B is not going. But we have an issue where thread A could see that B is not going, and exit the loop, and then we switch to B before A says, I'm going, and then B sees, well, A isn't going, and it exits the loop, and now we're back in the same data, uh, data race that we had before. So we really need some way to, um, uh, we need some way to have the system say, no, really, only one thread can be in this part of the code at a time. Uh, and one of the common tools for doing this is something called Exclusion lock is often shortened to mutex. And if someone talk, is talking about a lock, they usually mean a mutual exclusion lock. And if we say uh, this mutual exclusion lock will be some uh, variable shared by both threads, so
We've created this mutual exclusion lock, and then to protect the critical section, the region of our code where we only want one thread to be executing at a time. And so if one thread gets to this uh, trying to lock our mutex, if the lock is free, It will acquire the lock. If the lock is held, our thread will block, that is pause, until the lock becomes free, at which point it can acquire it and keep going. And so whichever, if both threads are executing this simultaneously, one of them is going to acquire the lock first. And that ensures that that is the only thread that proceeds through uh, the code until it gets to the unlock. And then the other one can go. Clock. And so is block in this case just like saying a while loop? Or just... So that depends on the particular lock implementation. If, if blocking is the same busy waiting in a while loop, it's often called a spin lock because it's spinning in a loop. Uh, but you can also have locks where uh, it suspends the thread, basically pauses the thread. It's not going to run on the CPU until something wakes it up. You should. Then, you know, in this situation, like, um, what do we, like, if we need to decide, like, I want to have thread A go before, it's like, so, so go before thread B, how do we? Make that order because this is like like whoever reached the lock first gets to execute first. Um, so we can in these um, uh, in these areas where we have uh, once we hold the lock, we can include other logic such as checking a variable that would indicate whether thread B uh, so like thread B could have some check whether thread A has gone, and if thread A hasn't gone, it just sort of loops back and tries to acquire the lock again later. Um, there are, this mutual exclusion lock is kind of the most common tool for synchronizing threads, but it's not the only one. There's something called a condition variable, where you can have a thread wait for some, for some other thread to wake it up and let it continue. And so if we particularly want one thread to wait for another, then you, you use this condition variable tool. Other questions? All right, and uh, the final thing I want to say about mutexes is uh, we've looked at a bunch of ways in which sort of checking some variable is not enough because we can get interleavings that mess that up. So what is special about this lock that lets it work where, say, our while loop didn't? Um, this mutex, being able to lock it, requires hardware support because, in particular, Acquiring a lock needs to be an atomic operation, meaning even if acquiring a lock involves multiple steps, either all of those steps need to happen or none of them can happen. So that this lock operation sort of happens all at once from the view of other threads, it, you can't divide it up into separate steps. It just happens uh, all at once or, or it doesn't. And these atomic operations, you can't make these happen uh, with software alone. You need actual CPU instructions that enforce this uh, 
uh, atomic property. Any other questions? All right. So let's yeah, let's do a little bit of practice. more easily than multiple processes. Lots of votes for B. That's excellent. It's because they are, are sharing memory through an address space. That's how the cooperation occurs. Uh, any questions on this one? All right. And let's also make sure that we are comfortable with this idea of a data race. Uh, what is a data race? Uh, looks like we have some votes for all four, so please discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about uh, data races. Uh, almost all of us are thinking C. That's excellent. Uh, why wouldn't we have a data race if the two threads are only reading? Bye. Because then the data never changes, so it doesn't matter which order. Exactly. Any number of threads can read the same data. It's not going to change it. We're not going to have this sort of non-deterministic behavior depending on which one reads first. Oh, I guess I'm just going to ask the next people question. Um, just because it says when two threads act on the same memory, can it happen with like more than two? Or uh, yes. Does it have a different name? Uh, no. Data race just means multiple threads. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kevin. Um, Specific or like after, but the the way to view that race with the mutual exclusion block, right? Is it still built in by the C? By the C of the code? Uh, so it, there is there are implementations of mutual exclusion locks in many different languages. In C, I think the most common one is there's it's not part of the C library, but it's a library you'll often find wherever C is installed called P threads. It's how you tend to create threads in P, and it's all, it also gives you locks and other sorts of uh, concurrency tools. What? Um, so is this like related to our lab lab anyway? Like, can we write a test case to check for ECP? Yeah, absolutely. So part uh, three of the lab is making uh, uh, making your proxy concurrent. Meaning, making sure that it um, uh, uh, can handle multiple connections at the same time. And uh, when you have, uh, um, uh, and so if you go the route of, say, using fork and having multiple processes to do multiple connections, uh, that can do the proxy part fine. Uh, but you may run into a problem when it comes to the cache part of the lab. Because if you have in memory, uh, when you get something from a server, you copy it over to the proxy's memory so that you can refer to it later. Remember, the two processes each have different memory. So if they change a cache, they're only changing their copy of the cache. And it won't actually change the cache for the proxy as a whole. And so uh, the auto, as the writer says, the auto grader does not check a lot of cases like this. Um, and I believe that uh, it does not have a test case that would expose the flaw of having a cache and like sort of not consistent across multiple processes. Um, uh, but using multiple threads is a much better solution there because then they can share the cache uh, in memory, but now 
two threads might try and modify the cache at the exact same time, uh, and that's going to potentially cause problems. Anytime you have two threads modifying a data structure simultaneously, they can start overwriting each other, and then your data structure just ends up kind of broken. Uh, and so that's the situation where a mutex could be very useful. All right, that's all the time we have. Happy Ultimate Friday to you all. Uh, I, uh, you may have seen in the announcement, I have uh, bonus lab hours, 3.30 to 4.30 in Olin 308 uh, for your Lab 5 and other questions. Uh, remember to make a Lab 5 check-in post, and I will see you Monday. <laughs>